Thank you, Tim and Conley, for leading us in worship this morning. As we approach the Gospel of John, I invite you to hear these words of Jesus. This is Jesus speaking from John chapter 7. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. So Father, this morning as we come to this conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well, speaking about living water and the gift of the Holy Spirit and quenching the thirst of our soul. Father, we confess to you that this is not a, a truth that we will be able to grasp with earthly eyes. And so we ask for your gracious work of the Holy Spirit to be at work even as we are reading through the Scripture that you're opening our eyes and our ears and helping us to understand what does it mean that living waters would flow out of our heart. So, Father, would you drive away every spirit of distraction from this room, and would you speak to us very personally and very powerfully? And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I hope you've got your copy of the Word of God, and we'll find John chapter 4. The text is also in your bulletin, or I'm sure if you're looking at it other ways, there's a Bible in the back of the pew in front of you as well. So, we are walking through the Gospel of John. If you're a guest with us today, we are walking through the Gospel of John. Last week, we looked at uh, the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And today, we're looking at this conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well in chapter 4. And these two people could not be more opposite on the ends of the spectrum in pretty much every conceivable way. Nicodemus is a, a man. She is a woman. Nicodemus is a Jew. She is a Samaritan. Nicodemus had a high degree of formal education. She probably had no formal education. Nicodemus is part of the ruling elite, and she's part of the hoi polloi, the commoners. Uh, life was going really well for Nicodemus. Uh, life had beaten her up pretty bad for this woman. Uh, we even have his name, <laughs> Nicodemus. We don't even know her name. I mean, could you get two different ends of the spectrum for Jesus to have a conversation with? And yet... Jesus is having the same conversation with both of these people. You need to hear that. Jesus is having essentially the very same conversation. Remember the thesis statement of the Gospel of John. John writes these things so that we would believe Jesus is the Christ, that we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but then when we put our faith in Him, we would have life in His name. Life abundant, life eternal. So Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus, good moral, religious, upstanding, well-respected. But Jesus comes to him and says, Nicodemus, unless something else happens, you're not going to have eternal life. You're not going to be part of the eternal kingdom of God unless you are born again, born from above, born of the Spirit. Jesus is talking about life in his name, eternal life in his name. This woman uh, who comes, we're about to read about in John chapter 4, life has, has beaten her up pretty well. We're going to find out that she's been married five times. Now, we're, I think sometimes we're too quick to assume that that means that she's some kind of immoral or anything like that. She may have just been really unlucky, right? Get married, guy dies of a heart attack. Husband number two dies of a heart attack. Husband number three dies of a heart attack. Husband number four dies of a heart attack. Husband number five dies of a heart attack. Probably husband number six doesn't want to see her walking down the aisle, you know. Uh, she's not real. But, but it doesn't matter in first century Rome whether you are divorced five times or widowed five times, your lot in life is pretty bleak. I mean, you got to remember, uh, women in first century couldn't inherit property, so if your husband died, all of, his, all of your family's belongings went to the oldest son. So you go through the wash five times with that, and by the end of that, you're, you're pretty much the least of these probably the object of scorn, and everyone's looking, what's wrong with you, kind of thing. I mean, life had beaten her up pretty good. And so when she comes to Jesus, the conversation about is, what does it look like to have life in his name, life abundant? Life in this broken world. How do you find life, joy, peace, love, 
comfort in the midst of this broken, messed up world. It's the same conversation. How do you find life in the name of Jesus? Now, we're going to work our way through this. i just go ahead and confess to you this is a fantastic story. There are so many rabbits and things we could talk about. We're just going to have to let some of them go because I want us to hear the word of the Lord for us this morning. So John chapter 4, beginning in verse 3. So Jesus left Judea, departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, and near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So quick uh, geography lesson, Judea's in the south, Samaria's just north of Judea, Galilee's north of that. If you want to get from Judea to uh, uh, Galilee, you've got to go through Samaria. Now, there were some Jews who would go around Samaria because there was this generational animosity between the Jews of Judea and the Samaritans. Uh, I don't want to to spend too much time on that, but it goes back 900 years, 900 years before Christ was born, when Solomon died, the kingdom split, and ever since then, the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes have been hating each other, fighting against each other, and there's 900 years of animosity when Jesus shows up at, the, at this well. But, but when John tells us that Jesus had to pass through Samaria, I think he's also telling us something else. This was a divine appointment. Jesus had to meet this woman. Jesus had a divine appointment with this woman to have this life-changing encounter with her. And we see these all through Scripture. The burning bush, Samuel in the temple with uh, the tabernacle, excuse me, with Eli. You think of Peter on the fishing boat. You think of Paul on the road to Damascus. Think in your own personal story when you came to saving faith in Christ. That was a divine appointment. That's when God came into your life and said, I want to have a conversation with you. And I want to call you to me. Uh, some of us have had more of those kind of encounters in our life, but this is one of those. Jesus had to have this conversation with this woman. And it's significant that John tells us it was the sixth hour. That's noon. Because a part of the normal household was you had to get fresh water every day. And so the ladies at the house had to go to the well and get fresh water every day. Usually they did that early in the morning when it was cool, and they did it as a group. It was kind of social hour. It was Starbucks at the water well. You know, let's go and let's go get the water together and come back. The fact that she's coming at noon and by herself tells us something, right? She's, she's kind of an outcast. She's on the outs. She probably got tired of all the whispers and the pointing and did you hear and all that. Kind of, so she just said, fine, I'll just come in the middle of the day when there's no one here. And so to this woman, verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone into the city to buy food and the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That little parenthetical, parenthetical thought actually the, literally says, Jews do not use the dishes that Samaritans have used. There was such generational hatred between the two, they wouldn't even drink after each other or, eat, eat, or talk to each other, particularly a man and a woman. But here Jesus says to the woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water. So all through the Old Testament, as it's looking forward to the coming Messiah, this image of living water is, flows all through the Old Testament. Just from the book of Isaiah alone. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, chapter 12. Chapter 49, springs of water will guide them. Chapter 44, I will pour water on the thirsty land. Chapter 55, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters uh, and drink. So over and over through the Old Testament, it's this image that when the Messiah comes, the Messiah will bring living water. And so here's Jesus saying to this woman, if you'll come to me, I will give you living water. Now, the, the, the reason I began today by reading from John chapter 7 because next week we're going to look at John chapter 7 as the Feast of the Tabernacles. And in that celebration, there is this water rite, this part of the celebration. And it's part of that where Jesus stands up and as the water is pouring, saying, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and they, I'll give you living water. And that's when Jesus defines very clearly what is living water. It is the Holy Spirit that flows out from us. And next week, we're going to try to... To, to define as best we can what exactly does it mean that the, living, the Holy Spirit is the living water that flows out of your heart. We're going to look at that next Sunday. But this is what he's inviting her to. 
Verse 11, she, she doesn't understand the conversation. Nicodemus didn't understand the conversation about being born again either. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well is deep. Where do you get the living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, you'll be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. For the water that I give will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, well, give me this water so I won't have to come all the way out here again. That's why I will not be thirsty. And Jesus said to her, call your husband. Just like Nicodemus, he's trying to go right to the point, right to the matter. She does not understand that she's thirsty. What he's talking about, about the thirst. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right, I have no husband. You've had five, and the one you have now is not your husband, so what you've said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. <laughs> What else do you say to someone who's just looked into your soul and verbalized your deepest painful moment out loud? I, I, I perceive that you must be a prophet. And then verse 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You know, for the longest time, I thought what the woman was doing here was changing the subject. You brought up something very painful. I don't want to talk about that. You said, where's your husband? My response is, none ya. It's none your business. Can we talk about something else? And so I'm going to change the subject. But I think really she's asking a, a theological question. And Jesus is engaging in a theological conversation with this woman. It's pretty amazing. Uh, if you were with us back in our Easter series back in March, we looked at the resurrection stories of John. And you remember the story of Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb and sees Jesus and thinks she, he's the gardener. And then Jesus calls her by name and she says, oh, you're Jesus. And then she falls and worships him and clings to him. And Jesus says to her, don't cling to me. But because I've not yet ascended to the Father, go and tell the disciples that I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. First time he calls God your father to anyone in scripture. And I'm ascending to my God and your God. I mean, he's having a pretty significant theological conversation with Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb. And I think he's doing the same thing here with this woman. This woman is saying, you know what? All of my life, I've been raised by our fathers to say, we're supposed to worship at this mountain. Mount Gerizim was the mountain she was talking about. You can see it from the village that she's at. She's probably pointing at that mountain and saying, all of my life, I've been told that's where you're supposed to go to worship. And you say we're supposed to go worship down there. So if you're this great prophet, you know, riddle me this, Batman, where are we supposed to worship? What's the truth about all of this? And just like Jesus took Nicodemus' religiosity and just kind of shook it up and said, none of that really matters unless you're born again, he does the same thing with her very significant, legitimate theological question. Where are we supposed to worship this God? And so look at what Jesus says, beginning in verse 21. This is a fantastic paragraph. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. She, she didn't say anything about the Father. She said, our Father has taught us this, but he talks about the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Right? It goes back to creation, goes back to the garden, goes back to Abraham, goes through uh, David, it goes through the, the temple sacrifices, it goes through the prophets, it goes through the mice. It, it is from the Jews, but it's not only for the Jews. It is from the Jews, but it is not just for the Jews. Salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here. And when John uses that language, the hour is coming, he's always talking about the cross. He's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and Jesus ascending to the right hand of the Father. So the hour is coming, it's now here. Jesus is here. The cross is about to change everything. And when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit, in truth. This is, this is the longest conversation that Jesus has with anyone in the gospel about worship. And he's having it with this woman, this Samaritan woman at the well, and talking about what, what exactly is God looking for in worshipers? From her perspective, is it to go to that place or go to this place? 
And Jesus is saying, you know, the cross is about to change all of that dramatically. And so this is what the Father is looking for, for those who such people to worship him. You know, we focus on the phrase worship in spirit and truth, and sometimes we think, well, that means our, our heart and our mind, our passions and our emotions and our intellect. We need, uh, we need both of those. And I think there's a lot of passages of Scripture that encourage us. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, right? We're supposed to be passionate in our worship. We're supposed to worship in truth. But I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at here. Because if we define spirit as emotions, right behind that, he says God is spirit. Are we saying God is, is emotions? I, I think he is, he is trying to paint a much richer picture for this woman about the worship that, that God desires. And to pick it up, we need to connect Nicodemus and the woman at the well. So what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? Your good works, your religion is not enough. Something else must take place in your life. You must be born again, born from above, born of the Spirit. Well, how does that happen? Well, the Son of Man is lifted up, and you look upon the Son of Man on the cross, and you believe this is God's provision for your sin. And when you believe in Jesus, you would be born again, born from above, born of the Spirit. Then he has this conversation with this woman at the well, this thirsty woman at the well, this woman who uh, life is beating her up, and she's looking for places to to quench her thirst, so she keeps trying, if I can just find another guy, find another guy, find another guy, if I can just meet this need, she is thirsty. And so Jesus says to her, you know, if, you, if you'll come to me as living water, I will satisfy your soul thirst, which is the Holy Spirit. So not only Nicodemus born of the Spirit, but the woman at the well born with the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit of God dwelling within us. So what is the Father seeking? Such people, thirsty people who have been born from above, born again, born of the Spirit, people who have been born with the Spirit, who now have the indwelling Spirit of God living in this kind of communal relationship, this fellowship with the one true God who is a spirit being, does not dwell in temples built by human hands, but is a spirit, divine, eternal God, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who existed before creation, who created everything, sustains creation, is the goal of creation, will make everything new in creation. This one eternal God is inviting us into this fellowship because we are born of the Spirit and we are born from the Spirit, with the Spirit. I mean, born of the Spirit and born with the indwelling Spirit of God into this community. And this is the kind of worship that God is looking for. He's not looking for an hour when you come to a place and sit down and you sing songs. He's not looking just for a place where you come and listen to a speech or a sermon for 30 minutes. Hopefully worship takes place in this room. Hopefully this room is filled with those who were born of the Spirit, born again, who were born with the Spirit in the indwelling Spirit of God. And hopefully we'd spend some time together as the body of Christ, fellowshipping with the one true God, and we experience that fellowship and community. Hopefully that takes place during this hour, but that's not just what God's called us to. He's called us to this life where we walk in fellowship because we are born of the Spirit and we are born with the Spirit. And we get all these different images in Scripture, Nicodemus, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God being part of that kingdom forever. Other times, Scripture talks about the household of God being part of the family of God, children sitting around the king's table. Sometimes it's the image of fellowship. Sometimes it's the image of abiding in Christ and in the vine and all that kind of stuff. But it's different images all inviting us to say, this is what God wants. He wants thirsty people to come to Him and be born again, born of the Spirit. He wants the, the Spirit to indwell us and to quench our thirst, and with that Spirit in us to commune with the one eternal triune God, to have fellowship with Him now and forever. This is the kind of worship that Jesus is seeking from us. So I hope this morning if you've heard, hey, religion is just all about trying to be good, go to church, uh, be better, I hope that you hear that the, the picture that God has in mind of the worship He's looking for is for thirsty people, born again, born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, soul thirst being quenched, living in such fellowship with the eternal triune God in this community that it far extends just this hour and this place on this campus. It is walking with Him. It's a beautiful picture of worship. 
And then the disciples come back and mess everything up. Well, verse 25, the woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Or literally, I am who speaks to you. It's the first time Jesus self-identifies very clearly, I am the Messiah, and is to a Samaritan woman at the well who is an outcast of life. I think we should catch that. Jesus loves the least of these. Then verse 27, then his clueless disciples came back. Clueless is in the Greek. Y'all may not see it there. His clueless disciples come back. They marveled he was talking with a woman. Now, the, the parable of the good Samaritan, excuse me, the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son has two parts to the story. First part of the story is about the, the younger son who goes off and squanders the inheritance, comes to his senses and comes back and the father welcomes him and kills the fatted calf and throws a party. That's act one of that story. Act two of the parable is the older brother. Is the older brother going to be happy that the younger brothers come home and the father's welcomed them? Is the older brother going to welcome and be part of that party? There's the first step and the second step. And this story is very much the same way. Act one is Jesus has welcomed this woman at the well to be part of the family of God. Now the older brothers show up and the question is, well, what are the disciples are going to think about this? And so here are the older brothers. They came, verse 27, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. No one said, what do you seek? Why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this man be the Christ? And don't miss verse 30. They went out of the town and were coming to him. Right? So why, why the disciples are having, she, she's left the water pot. She's gone back to the town. She said, hey, I just met someone. I think he's the Christ. And now the village, they're coming towards Jesus. And the disciples, who have no clue what's going on in verse 31, they're urging him to eat. You know, we bought chicken eat, and it's gonna, the grease is going to harden if we don't eat right now. So, Rabbi, eat. And he said to them, I, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And so the disciples said to one another, did someone bring him something to eat? They have no idea. And so here's Jesus. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. I can, I can see Jesus, as he says this, he's pointing to the crowds from the village who are coming to see him. Look up. All those thirsty people are coming to me to living water. Don't you see them? Lift up your eyes. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages, gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. Here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. All these thirsty people are coming to living water. You had nothing to do with that sowing, but you're about to be part of the harvest. And after the resurrection, I'm going to send you out and you're going to do a lot of sowing and you won't always be part of the harvest. But the sower and the reaper are working together for this, right? Interesting. Uh, side note here. Uh, the Great Commission, when Jesus sends out his disciples, he says to them, you shall be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, and then where? Samaria. Acts chapter 8, it talks about Philip, and it says he goes to a city in Samaria. So I'm guessing here, it may not be this city, but can you imagine Philip going back to this very city who had already spent time with Jesus and said, let me tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> let me tell you what's happened since Jesus left you. Let me tell you about the cross. Let me tell you about the resurrection. Let me tell you about the ascension. Let me tell you about the good news of what Christ has done for us as they would be part of that harvest. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him, verse 39, because of the woman's testimony when she said, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This really is kind of the first example of cross-cultural missions, so to speak, going to a different people group and sharing the good news of the gospel, and they come to learn about Jesus. Fascinating story. There's so much here. Let me just draw your attention this morning with two phrases that Jesus uses in this story. And if you would just meditate on those phrases for the rest of the week and let the Holy Spirit continue to speak to you. The first one is out of verse 23. 
The Father is seeking such people to worship him. This is the, the aim of the gospel. This is what God is looking for. He's looking for thirsty people who will come to living waters, realize that it is their sin that has separated them. It's the sin that has broken this world. It is sin that's caused all of this problem. Look upon Jesus as Jesus is lifted up on the cross and believe. And as a result of that, they are born again, born from above, born of the Spirit. But even more though, they are born with the Spirit, born again with the Spirit. The indwelling Spirit of God indwells them and begins to quench their thirst. And as that thirst is quenched, that rises up into worship and into fellowship with the one true God. This is what God's picture is of what it means to be part of the body of Christ and the family of God. It is not just trying to be good and do better. It is to be born again and to be indwelled by the Spirit of God and to find living water that quenches our thirst and to be part of this community, the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, the household of God for now and forever. It's not just about grin and bear it until you die and get to go to heaven, but it is about finding life now as well. The Father is seeking such people to worship Him. So let me just invite you this morning, if you're thirsty, your soul thirst, the deepest desire that you have in your heart, mind, and soul for love, for peace, for joy, for comfort, those deep belongings can only be met by your creator and sustainer of life. And Jesus comes to you and says, I want, you to, I want to give you living water so that your soul can be satisfied. The second phrase I'd like for you to focus on about out of verse 35, Jesus says to the disciples, lift up your eyes and see the fields. Lift up your eyes and see the fields. Jesus was calling his disciples to join his work to bring living water to thirsty people. Essentially, this is our calling as the body of Christ, as the church. If we have come to know Jesus, the living water, to satisfy our soul, and we have come to know people in our life, people that we know and love who are thirsty, we have the opportunity and the invitation to share living water with those who are thirsty. And so the church wants to give you a gift today. We've bought uh, several hundred, a couple hundred copies of this little book called Before You Share Your Faith. And uh, just they're out there in the lobby and invite you on your way out after church is over to swing by uh, and grab a copy of the book if, if you would like. Uh, we talked about, as Deacon, the Deacons read a book several months ago, uh, I guess it was last year maybe, called uh, Contagious Faith. Talked about five different ways that we are wired to share our faith. Just five different styles of evangelism. And according to that book, the, the five, there's friendship building. People who, who develop friendships with people, and as that friendship develops, uh, and they find out how their friend is thirsty in the beginning to talk about the living water and meeting that. That was you know, really Katie's story this morning was a friend who invited to church and go to camp. And it was through that experience that came to saving faith. Uh, the second style is selfless serving. This style is those who are, are more naturally wired to, to meet tangible needs in the name of Christ as an expression of Christ. And then as you meet that need and you have opportunity and conversations, why are you doing this? Well, I'm doing this because God's met my need, God's provided for me, and I'd like for you to know God's love. So through serving. The third way that this book talks about is just storytelling, telling your testimony. This is what the woman at the well did. She went back to her village and just said, let me just tell you something that happened to me. I think I just met someone who told me everything. I, I think he's the Christ and just told her story. And so for some of you, that's how you're wired. Um, you just, you've got a story to tell and how Christ has... has quench the thirst of your soul. A fourth way is what he calls reason giving. Reason giving is helping people wrestle with the questions that they have that's keeping them from putting their faith into Christ. And this is what Jesus did with the woman at the well, right? My fathers have always said we're supposed to worship there. Y'all say we're supposed to worship there. What's the deal? What's the real religion here, right? She's struggling with that. And Jesus helped her to understand how the cross had changed all of that. So some of you, that's how you're wired. You're, you're, it's more easy for you to get in faith conversations and help people wrestle with questions. The fifth way is, is truth-telling. 
uh, kind of, we've, sometimes we call this uh, confrontational evangelism. It's just kind of more direct telling the truth. Jesus with Nicodemus. Hey, unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I, I was listening to Alistair Begg. You may know the name Alistair Begg. I uh, listened to his sermon on this uh, passage. And he, he was telling the story of he was out golfing. And uh, someone got assigned to be a part of his foursome. So you're doing that whole who are you, what do you do kind of thing. And so he's about to tee off. And the guy found out he was a pastor. And he's like, well, how's business going? And, and Alistair kind of smart off and said, well, business is great because there's sinners everywhere. Potential customers all the time. And, you know, teed off. Uh, several holes down the line, you know, the, they were on the putting green, I think. And the, the guy was like, you know, that kind of offended me. And Alistair Beck said, well, how did that offend you? Did you call me a sinner? And, well, aren't you a sinner? No, I'm not a sinner. <laughs> to which he said, well, that is incredible. There is only one person in the history of mankind that has not been a sinner. It's God himself who has become flesh. You must be the son of God. Uh, just kind of real confrontive with, with the truth. Maybe that's your st style, combination truth teller, sarcastic. I don't know. Uh, but there's different ways. The point of that book was we are all uniquely wired to share living water with thirsty people. But some of the time what we need to do is to lift up our eyes and see the fields. Because we are so focused on getting our own soul thirst quenched in the living water that sometimes we forget to look around at the people around us who are thirsty who need the living water as well. And so that's what uh, this book, Twan, we're just inviting you to, to get a copy of this book. It's five ways to be evangelism ready. It's a very simple book to read. One of the reasons I like this book is how it starts. The writer basically says, I've never been any good at evangelism and I've always felt guilty about it. I think that's 95% of the church today, right? I, I stink at this and I feel bad about it, so I'd rather not talk about it. <laughs> Uh, and this is not a book to, another book to try to make you feel guilty about evangelism. I think we kind of bring that to the party with ourselves. We don't need another book about that. This is a book just simply to encourage us to say, let's lift up our eyes and let's see the fields. That there are, there are thirsty people around us who need living water. And we've been given the, the opportunity to connect thirsty people with living water. And so before you share your faith, just five things to think about uh, about that. So if you would just uh, get a copy of uh, this on your way out, encourage you to read through that and, and pray about that as well. So our song of response this morning is, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And we're singing through the gospel story. So just you know, pay attention to the words we're about to read in our longing in our darkness, now the light of life has come. And I just encourage as we sing and worship through this this morning, on the one hand, be rejoicing in the way that the living water has quenched your thirst and celebrate that. But on the other hand, would we be listening with the other ears to lift up our eyes and may the Lord remind us of or call us to someone in our life that we know who's thirsty that maybe this thing that we're rejoicing in as we sing, we might be able to share with them.